Afternoon folks, this is uh, Staff Sergeant Bryant with the CKC. Um, I'd like to welcome you to another one of our speaker series. Uh, the CKC, the Cultural Knowledge Consortium, is a joint interagency effort of the U.S. government to support the development of socio-cultural knowledge and facilitate knowledge exchange across a breadth of social cultural communities. Um, you can learn more about us at ckc.com. Uh, excuse me, you can learn more about the CKC at www.culturalknowledge.org. Today's speaker is uh, Doug Baston from uh, NGA. He'll be speaking about the ground truth in human security. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible during his uh, presentation. If you have any questions, you'll be able to enter them in the question and answer chat pod it will be in the upper left hand corner when we switch to his presentation um, to help us in prove everything please leave your questions till the end and we'll get to them this webinar is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on the CKC website if you wish to view it later or come back and revisit any part of it um, this is an unclassified uh, presentation so please keep it that way thank you very much all right uh, Doug as your uh, s slides pull up here go ahead and uh, you can take over and continue with your speech Hey, this is Doug Batson at the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Mothership in Springfield, Virginia. How is the audio connection? It's good, sir. You're uh, sounding loud and clear. Excellent. I chose this presentation's title ground truth in human security very carefully because it is also the tentative title for a fall 2012 publication from the Army War College's Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute. I've been conducting research at the Army PKSOI on the role of land governance in United Nations peacekeeping and also in U.S. stability operations. So think of this as a uh, sneak preview of the forthcoming publication. Starting in Afghanistan, I've been involved in researching the role of land tenure and property rights in reconstructing, reconstruction and stability operations for the last six years. In this graphic on the left-hand side, you'll see that I am sitting as a guest of the Norwegian Refugee Council, an NGO in Afghanistan that is conducting land dispute resolution. In the yellow box, you'll see that it is a, a drill-down graphic of the one on the previous page and not visible on this topographic map are the tens of thousands of mud straw homes recently constructed uh, along the river. To get at this ground truth, one has to drill down and then one will find, perhaps to one's surprise, uh, informal settlements, which is the United Nations uh, euphemism for slums that they have uh, sprung up here. In, in this next graphic you'll see that with imagery alone one can discern very little of the human geography or cultural knowledge of who is on the land, how are they on the land, and why are they on that land. I'll introduce the word uh, cadaster here because it's not a word that we usually use in American English. 
It derives from the Latin for a uh, land and property registry. And a cadaster could answer these questions, uh, who and how and why are persons tied to the land. In fact, I'll suggest that with cadastral data, a new discipline of property intelligence could come about. And the idea behind that is to take a person, which was blinking, and tie that person to a geo-reference land parcel. So this is the idea behind the cadaster, and I'm very excited to show you how this idea has been realized. Now, this graphic, I'm sure you can identify with the situation. Uh, all too often in the developing world, an advanced party member from a military service, from the State Department, from USAID, or even an NGO will uh, go out to be the advanced party and scout out an area of operation let's say it's for humanitarian assistance or disaster response or some other type of stability operation and there uh, have an interview with the host nation government official who tells this advanced party member that oh your area of operation is all government land have no worries when in actuality the uh, human terrain looks something like this so looking at these overlapping layers, let's imagine a, a well-watered valley, if you will, and every year a family of herders do what their ancestors have done for century. That is, they bring their flocks to pasture in the valley. That would be layer A grazing. And in this same valley, there are also farmers practicing their ancestral livelihood. That would be layer B, agricultural. And these two groups have had a long-standing verbal agreement that allow the herders to have water rights every spring. But recently, a major drought has forced a related ethnic group from a neighboring country to also settle in this valley. And the government here does not enjoy friendly relations with this neighboring country and considers these new arrivals to be illegal squatters. Decades ago, unbeknownst to any of the parties, the herders or the farmers, the host nation government, perhaps in some obscure constitutional clause, laid claim to the entire valley as state domain, and that would be layer D. Well, the government never attempted to develop this land, that is, until now, when a foreign company notified the government of a valuable resource and put a lot of money on the table and negotiated a lease and that would be layer C. So as you see for each of these four parties a different land right is at work and we can also throw in the fifth party yes the squatters are illegal but nevertheless they are there and have to be accounted for. So this human terrain looks vastly different than what the advance party member was told by the host nation government official that, oh, where you're going, it's all government land, no worries. So at this point, I want to introduce the Land Administration Domain Model, or LADM for short, because in this very messy example of uh, overlapping land rights, this conceptual model can register the overlapping and even the competing claims to land. And it works like this. In the developing world, less than 30% of the cadastral coverage actually conforms to ground truth. Now, modeling the relationship between people and land is very complex. So I came across this land administration domain model some uh, six years ago in the Netherlands. And I'm very high on it because 
its strength is to capture a suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities. That's the yellow box. Or what we would call social tenure relationships in non-Western societies that links persons, that's the green box, with geographic places, the blue box. And these are geo-referenced geographic places. So very different than the Western concept of formal land deeds and titles that have to do with ownership right or perhaps a, a leasee's rights. This suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities would include uh, issues like who has the right in this communal or tribal land to harvest ground nuts for food, to harvest timber for uh, cooking fires. Oh, again, to pasture their flocks. We're talking about water rights. And what about uh, nomadic people? Do they have transit rights? Or these might be the herders who need to pasture their flocks differently um, spring and fall, summer and winter. In the developing world, those who have informal land rights, they don't have fee simple ownership where they can buy and sell a plot of land. They'd be very happy to have occupancy rights, to be the sole and undisputed person who has a right to dwell in a place. Across the globe, it is estimated that one and a half billion people are subject to political and criminal violence because they lack one thing, and that being formalized property rights. And this LADM can cost effectively register land rights for every human being on the planet via this suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities. And that would do a lot, would do very much to improve human security. I have been tracking this land administration domain model for a number of years again. It became a new work item for the International Standards Organization, or ISO, and then a draft standard. And now it is in the stage of a final draft international standard, or FDIS for short, which means by the end of the year, peace builders would have a new tool in the toolbox. But more importantly, this would be a brand new lens for sociocultural dynamics or understanding the human terrain. On the next slide, I'll tell you about an opportunity I had to see the LADM in action. Um, Thomson Reuters company, even though the uh, LADM is not quite yet an ISO standard, this company went ahead and built proprietary software called Open Title. And it's really quite ideal for the developing world because a site license costs um, only $600. And due to my previous writing, Thomson Reuters invited me last year to observe Open Title's use in a USAID funded land registry project in Ghana, West Africa. Well, there's been a lot of USAID land registry projects across the developing world. So what makes this project different from the ones that uh, have failed to register people's land rights? The previous attempts all were top-down, government-imposed registration schemes, where this one is very different. It is bottom-up. It is demand-driven. So think in the developing world why people would be reluctant to register their land with a uh, government in a top-down approach. We make a joke about it here in our country that, oh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. But in the developing world, there is actually some very valid fears about having uh, government too close, especially when it comes to one's land. Namely, 
people don't want to be taxed. And I won't say that glibly or universally, but in the developing world, they don't care to be taxed where they are unlikely to see any type of benefit from the taxation. No improved infrastructure, no roads, no communications, nothing that they would expect to see in their lifetime from paying taxes. There's also um, a great deal of corruption in these governments. And when one doesn't possess an automobile and is required to travel from point A to point B for uh, seven separate steps to go to different government offices, and in each one the uh, low-level GS5 equivalent clerk um, wants a bribe for stamping the paperwork, doing his or her job, uh, that gets old in a hurry and people don't care to cooperate. Lastly, there's also the fear of making a mistake. Poor people are not used to dealing with government and they have a genuine fear that with all these forms to fill out, one mistake is going to result in a fine, draw undue attention to them, and it could even result in expropriation of their land. Now, Ghana is a relatively stable and progressive uh, African state. Uh, unlike Afghanistan, one can go out and do field surveys without fear of being shot at. And I was even surprised that no one yelled at us as we were uh, tromping around with our handheld um, uh, survey instruments and uh, we did attract attention. A lot of neighbors wanted to know what we are doing there. So I, I will tell you what we were doing there. 80% uh, of all lands in Ghana are under customary tenure. That means they are not governed formally with deeds and land t uh, titles and outright ownerships. Tribal chieftains, and as I learned there are a number of uh, layers to uh, chieftains, they are charged with managing land for their constituencies, for their peoples. Yet this is a difficult task to manage vast uh, tracts of land and s population pressures are mounting with uh, half of the population in Ghana uh, under 22 years old. So they need some help and one uh, increasingly significant means of help is the customary land secretariat. This is not a government entity, it's an NGO. And these um, representatives of, of people groups, I will call them, are fair and honest brokers and they are recording and they are managing these customary land situations. And they would benefit greatly by something like the um, land administration domain model and you see on the graphic there that there's also a social tenure domain model which is a specialized pro-poor version um, related to ISO standard 19152 and the open title software as I mentioned before is compliant in its tool set and the last slide I will show you is the um, product of registering properties with this open title software called a property folio. Now on the right hand side of this graphic you will see with a very nice watermark a lease. In fact it's a 99 year lease from a chief to one of his constituents that they have the occupancy right to dwell in a certain area for 99 years and the big chief has his his watermark on there. Excuse me, I failed to mention that there are um, 35 different customary land secretariats in operation across Ghana. Um, some of them are doing um, a great job, others lack the uh, staff and the funds and the um, ability to have a place to do their recording, some type of infrastructure. So it's kind of uh, uneven 
as far as their capacities. But I, I am um, quite upbeat on the potential here, especially if uh, they were equipped by something as low cost as uh, open title software. So we'll look at the uh, nuts and bolts of that coming up. So for you techies out there that are interested in um, software architecture, here's a screenshot of the uh, open title, how it ties people to places using this suite of informal rights restrictions um, and responsibilities, not formal titles and deeds. I see some questions about the terminology I use in describing the social tenure domain model. Let me address that now. This was an idea of principles within the United Nations uh, UN Habitat, which is the settlements organization within the UN. They did not care for the original terminology used by the LADM. So they came up with the uh, different semantics only. The conceptual model is the same. But it addresses the situation where people do not have formal land rights. They have some type of socio-tenure to land. So in the case of Ghana, there are a number of sharecropping situations that have indigenous names that I can hardly pronounce, such as uh, Abuna and Abusa. And these are unique to that culture, where a sharecropper would give 30% uh, of his or her crop yield to the chief, and the other would be 50% um, of the crop yield to the chief. And these are examples of uh, customary land tenure. What links that person to the land? Well, it's a sharecropping arrangement called Abuna or Abusa or some other indigenous name, and that would be recorded in the um, in the open title software and the social tenure domain model again. The STDM is the pro poor version of the land administration domain model uh, now in its final draft form ISO one nine one five two. So the beauty is that this um, open title software is able to record what formal property registries could never do, and that is this suite of informal rights restrictions and responsibilities. It can also record, again, this is the overlapping situation, cases where there are titles and deeds where other entities have a land claim over the same parcel. I mentioned before that this USAID funded project was demand driven, bottom up. So Ghanaians wanting to obtain a microfinance loan so they can improve their livelihood, they volunteered to have their land rights registered so they could use it for collateral for what was, let's say, a 400 US dollar loan. And with that loan, they could expand their business, or in one case, uh, purchase a few sewing machines to uh, start up a business. And that's the first step of uh, getting out of poverty and, and breaking that cycle. So I'll let you um, technically incline people. Uh, read the information on open title. You see ILS in the graphic. That was the uh, name of the Malkney International Land Systems that uh, last summer was purchased by Thomson Reuters. And you can go to the ThomsonReuters.com uh, website and query open title and you'll see um, all of the latest and greatest um, information about this proprietary software. So how does it work? Well, here you see a schoolmaster in an informal settlement.
settlement, or what we would call a slum area outside of Accra in Ghana. And he's an entrepreneur, and he built a schoolhouse because parents, even parents in poor families, they know the way out of poverty is an education. They're not in a formally recognized part of the city, so there are no government services there for them, uh, no drainage, no trash removal, no services, no schools. So this fellow set up a schoolhouse, and it did very well. Parents sent their children to school. It was a quality institution. So with the uh, revenue, he wants to expand his school, and he applied for one of these microfinance loans. So if you remember the LADM schema, a suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities tying persons to places, here you see the persons part. And the person here is a natural person. It could be an individual, like the schoolmaster, a family, a clan, a sub-tribe, a tribe, or it could be a non-natural person, such as an organization, a company, a church, or a mosque. So all the particulars about the person are recorded here. And then we go to the other side of the equation, persons that are related to georeference parcels. So here is our community college educated survey technician walking the perimeter of the parcel. We had our own CORE's ground station there in Ghana, so the coordinates were quite accurate, and that met the condition uh, of the government of Ghana to accept these property for portfolios because the accuracy of the field surveys was quite good. So you see the commercial imagery and the parcel highlighted there. And lastly, to ascertain the ground truth, the team interviewed the neighbors. And often we didn't have to go looking for them. They were quite curious, seeing the field surveying being conducted. So often they came out and asked what's going on. And the uh, client would say, I'm getting a microfinance loan to improve my livelihood and explain what was going on. And then more often than not, the neighbors would say, well, when can I have my uh, land surveyed? I'd like to improve my livelihood also. So this um, survey team going out, that's the most expensive part of the project. In my few weeks there, the average cost for surveying a parcel was around $90. Uh, it can be less expensive than that in other parts of Africa. And we were able to do uh, five or six locations in a day if they were uh, clustered in the same geographic area. Um, that meant a lot of uh, off-road travel to uh, get to one place or the other. So here is that suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities, the RRR that links people to places. And again, the beauty of the LADM that it allows for every human being land rights, even the informal ones, to finally be documented. And this could bring much relief to the 1.5 billion poor on the globe who are often exploited by the powerful elite, the slumlords, the criminals, and even insurgents who threaten these people with violence that if they don't um, pay extortion to uh, fund, the <coughs> fund the illegitimate activities, or in the case of Afghanistan, I hand over your firstborn son for our militia, <coughs> will knock your house down or worse, and these people have no recourse. They have no formal land rights. Well, the LADM is a way to cost-effectively record these, and I showed the customary land secretariats earlier, an uh, NGO that has the technical capability to act as a land registry when the government doesn't have the capacity to do so. 
So here is a powerful incentive for poor people to improve their uh, dwelling, to upgrade their property. Just in, here in the U.S., if we rent out our property, we don't expect renters to take as good as care of it as owners. And in the case where people have no land rights, absolutely zero, they are loath to make any improvements, even digging a drainage ditch, when they know that a government agent or a powerful uh, slumlord or criminal boss will um, take notice and try to extort something um, from them for the continued right to uh, dwell there legally or illegally. This is the last slide. This is the product that I talked about. It's not a legal document. It's a paralegal document called a property folio. And on the right, you see a person, and in this case, a Ghanaian national identity card. And that person is tied to a geo-reference parcel. And above is the uh, fictitious information, I will add, and the relationship type, the restrictions, right restriction responsibilities would be recording there and it could just read occupancy right, uh, sharecropping right, abuna or busa or some other socio-tenure to land that is informal and not recorded in the legal system. Hey, and as an extra bonus, we even have a ground photo of um, what this looks like. And this is the uh, schoolhouse, actually, that I mentioned earlier. Well, all this is good for development and people getting out of poverty and USAID continues to fund this project. That's well and good. But in the intelligence community, as you can see here, better than any um, map that depicts human geography, such as which languages are spoken in this region or what religions are practiced here, this, I submit to you, is a much better example of human geography, socio-cultural dynamics, uh, human terrain. This is information that if we had a number of these, an aggregate would lend itself to analysis and the context of a socio-cultural group would be much richer if we understood people's relationships to land and where that does not exist where the host nation government is not able to make a complete cadaster. There are situations such as uh, post-disaster after a tsunami or an earthquake or in post-conflict situations. Afghanistan and Iraq come to mind where we had 100,000 plus boots on the ground that this type of information could be created. And in Ghana, with a $600 site license and a laptop and a digital camera, we were creating human terrain geoint. That concludes my presentation. I will be happy to take your questions in the chat area. Thank you, Doug. While we're waiting for people to uh, type, while we're waiting for uh, people to type in their questions, I have one for you. Why is land registration important to human security, specifically like peace and development? Well, that is a great question. And growing up, as most of us have in the West, what made uh, our country, especially in the 19th century, democratic, able to expand from Atlantic to Pacific Coast, to have transportation, corridors, railroads, canals, all this wealth had to come from somewhere. And it was taxation from the government put to a use that benefited 
not elite and not lining the, the pockets of the government officials, but put to use for the welfare of the entire nation. So these underpinnings were really institutions, legal frameworks that had to do with the enforcement of property rights. So it's not elections that make a democracy. It is the transparency and the formality of property rights that creates uh, economically thriving societies and makes democracy work. So we all grew up with this, but it occurred in the 19th century. The roots of, let's say, a, uh, a title company, title insurance, uh, courts, judiciary, and police that actually Im enforce property rights. Unlike in the developing world, when we drive home tonight, we don't expect to see a crime boss threatening us or having a bulldozer on site to demolish our our, um, our home because we didn't pay up. We have enforcement. And this came about through what is now an unsung uh, number of institutions that uphold property rights. Okay, thank you. And uh, one of our guests, Kristen, she says, what protects people from those uh, corrupt government practices that you mentioned um, that made them want to hide their location information? What protects people from corrupt government practices? I'm not sure I quite un understand the question. Um, that's really outside of the project that I was observing. In past, and it, there's a history there where governments are predatory and people don't have trust in governments getting too close. And especially with the only asset that a poor family has, it's their land. And they might be lacking a formal title or a deed and the ability to uh, buy and sell, but that's all they have for their livelihood and they don't trust government for the reasons I mentioned. What made this project unique is that it was again demand driven, bottom up, that there was some tangible incentive, a microfinance loan for people to come forth and voluntarily have their land registered because they saw that it would improve their livelihood. Most uh, people in the developing world don't see any benefit of government registering their land. It evokes a lot of fear. I see Major Murray's question about um, to resolve licks between the two parties. Um, during my time in Ghana, uh, I was only there a few weeks. No, I did not have to. In Afghanistan, oh yes, there was a lot of conflict resolution and it was not taking place through the courts, ju the judiciary, or with police enforcement because those institutions simply did not exist at the district level. But using customary practices of conflict resolution brokered by the Norwegian Refugee Council with the added status of being a United Nations partner, uh, that made people come to the table and in the employ of the Norwegian Refugee Council were Afghan nationals trained in conflict resolution. And I spent many hours sitting on the floor and observing uh, the parties uh, come to some type of resolution. And it usually involves some type of compensation to let loose of a land claim. Uh, Carl Prinslow, you're asking about um, NGA retaining and um, managing uh, property records that could be recorded by the LADM and its uh, open title software that's already out on the market. Uh, I would like to see that. I want to be hopeful that with the momentum we have with Director Long and the Human Geography program for the entire intelligence community being uh, steered here at NGA, 
There is a land theme amongst the 13 human geography themes that this would be something uh, that we could do. Of course, having uh, the intelligence word in your title gives a lot of potential partners pause to uh, share data. So I'm thinking, Carl, that uh, CKC might be a uh, better clearinghouse of such data if and when it is shared. And in the case of this Ghanaian data, it resides with the finance institution. And depending on the relationship and the uh, agreements in place, whether that would be shared or not. Uh, I made sure that I had fictitious data or um, names blotted off of the records in order to uh, show you what I did from the uh, open title project. Carl, your second question is truncated a bit. Um, when the property rights are understood by members of the society. In the developing world, uh, there's a lot of ignorance. And again, fear comes into play here. Most squatters know that they are squatters. Poor people know that they don't have documents for their land. And they know that it would take uh, seven trips to the city to go to seven different offices to get the required paperwork that they don't quite understand. So there is room in this situation for an entity, a sub-state entity, an NGO. And in Ghana, that is, again, the customary land secretariat, which are not government agents. They are representatives of the people who explain the land and property rights. They even have to explain it to the chiefs, who are the custodians of the land, so they uh, act accordingly. Uh, chiefs are human beings, and they're tempted by financial gain. And when a uh, foreign company comes in and says, uh, we found some valuable minerals under your soil, and we'd like to, you to sign this lease, and you get an extra 100000 U.S. dollars for doing so, um, things are not always on the up and up. And the chiefs uh, are often caught selling out their people, their constituency, for private gain. Ah, being asked about land policy in Afghanistan. When I was last there in 2009, there was a draft land policy, but for political reasons that I will never understand, it has not been enacted. So without a land policy, in my opinion, all development and reconstruction efforts are hamstrung. Now, Kristen asked a very good question. If the government can take the squatter's land, won't open title tell them specifically who to target? Well, poss possibly. A lot of... Uh, Governments are predatory, and they would use information to find out who has some wealth. So they can come and find a way to expropriate that wealth, even the land. So what's missing in these uh, areas of the developing world is a civil society that demands accountability and transparency of property rights, something that we have enjoyed in this uh, country for generations, so much so that we've lost track of the institutions that are out there that uh, enable that to happen. And that would be a large part of uh, development and peace building. And that's what I've written my manuscript on. And I expect that to be out in October, the uh, PKSOI. So if you will send me uh, an email. I'll put you on the uh, distribution list where you can uh, download a copy from the PKSOI website. And I'll give you my email address. It is douglas.e, as in echo, dot batson, B-A-T-S-O-N, at N-G-A dot mil.
All right, that looks like all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, topic today. It was great. Um, on behalf of the CKC Director Carl Prinslow, I'd like to sincerely extend my appreciation to you for sharing with us today. Um, if anyone here has a topic they'd like to present or any other follow-up questions, please email or call us. You can email us at speakers at culturalknowledge.org. Looks like I'm having a little overlay with my slide. Hang on a second. Here we go. Um, and feel free to visit us at culturalknowledge.org. And this speaker series was recorded and will be available on our document library on the CKC web portal for you to view later. And uh, thank you again, and we will see you next time. Globe, it is estimated that one and a half billion people are subject to political and criminal violence because they lack one thing and that being formalized property rights and this LADM can cost effectively register land rights for every human being on the planet via this suite of rights restrictions and responsibilities and that would do a lot would do very much to improve human security. I have been tracking this land administration domain model for a number of years again. It became a new work item for the International Standards Organization or ISO and then a draft standard and now it is in the stage of a final draft international standard or FDIS for short which means by the end of the year Peace builders would have a new tool in the toolbox, but more importantly, this would be a brand new lens for sociocultural dynamics or understanding the human terrain. On the next slide, I'll tell you about an opportunity I had to see the LADM in action. Um, Thomson Reuters company, even though the uh, LADM is not quite yet an ISO standard, this company went ahead and built proprietary software called Open Title. And it's really quite ideal for the developing world because a site license costs um, only $600. And due to my previous writing, Thomson Reuters invited me last year to observe open titles used in a USAID funded land registry project in Ghana, West Africa. Well, there's been a lot of USAID land registry projects across the developing world. So what makes this project different from the ones that uh, have failed to register people's land rights? The previous attempts all were top-down, government-imposed registration schemes, where this one is very different. It is bottom-up. It is demand-driven. So think in the developing world why people would be reluctant to register their land with a uh, government in a top-down approach. We make a joke about it here in our country that, oh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. But in the developing world, there is actually some very valid fears about having uh, government too close, especially when it comes to one's land. Namely, people don't want to be taxed. And I won't say that glibly or universally, but in the developing world, they don't care to be taxed where they are unlikely to see any type of benefit from the taxation. No improved infrastructure, no roads, no communications, nothing that they would expect to see in their lifetime from paying taxes. There's also um, a great deal of corruption in these governments. And when one doesn't possess an automobile and is required to travel from point A to point B for uh, seven separate steps to go to different government offices, and in each one the uh, low-level GS5 equivalent clerk 
um, wants a bribe for stamping the paperwork, doing his or her job, uh, that gets old in a hurry and people don't care to cooperate. Lastly, there's also the fear of making a mistake. Poor people are not used to dealing with government and they have a genuine fear that with all these forms to fill out, one mistake is going to result in a fine, draw undue attention to them, and it could even result in expropriation of their land. Now, Ghana is a relatively stable and progressive uh, African state. Uh, unlike Afghanistan, one can go out and do field surveys with without fear of being shot at and I was even surprised that no one yelled at us as we were uh, tromping around with our handheld um, uh, survey instruments and uh, we did attract attention a lot of neighbors wanted to know what we are doing there so I, I will tell you what we were doing there uh, eighty percent of all lands in Ghana are under customary tenure that means they are not governed formally with deeds and land uh, titles and outright ownerships. Tribal chieftains, and as I learned, there are a number of uh, layers to uh, chieftains, they are charged with managing land for their constituencies, for their peoples. Yet this is a difficult task to manage vast uh, tracts of land and Population pressures are mounting with uh, half of the population in Ghana uh, under 22 years old. So they need some help. And one uh, increasingly significant means of help is the customary land secretariat. This is not a government entity. It's an NGO. And these... Um, representatives of, of people groups I will call them are fair and honest brokers and they are recording and they are managing these customary land situations and they would benefit greatly by something like the um, land administration domain model and you see on the graphic there that there's also a social tenure domain model which is a specialized pro-poor version um, related to ISO standard 19152 and the open title software as I mentioned before is compliant in its tool set and the last slide I will show you is the um, product of registering properties with this open title software called a property folio now on the right hand side of this graphic you will see with a very nice watermark a lease. In fact, it's a 99-year lease from a chief to one of his constituents that they have the occupancy right to dwell in a certain area for 99 years, and the big chief has his, his watermark on there. Excuse me, I failed to mention that there are um, 35 different customary land secretariats in operation across friendly relations with this neighboring country and considers these new arrivals to be illegal squatters. Decades ago, unbeknownst to any of the parties, the herders or the farmers, the host nation government, perhaps in some obscure constitutional clause, laid claim to the entire valley as state domain and that would be layer D. Well, the government never attempted to develop this land, that is, until now, when a foreign company notified the government of a valuable resource and put a lot of money on the table and negotiated a lease, and that would be layer C. So as you see, for each of these four parties, a different land right is at work. And we can also throw in the fifth party. Yes, the squatters are illegal, but nevertheless, they are there and have to be accounted for. So this human terrain looks vastly different than 
what the advance party member was told by the host nation government official that, oh, where you're going, it's all government land, no worries. So at this point, I want to introduce the Land Administration Domain Model, or LADM for short, because in this very messy example of uh, overlapping land rights, this conceptual model can register the overlapping and even the competing claims to land. It works like this. In the developing world, less than 30% of the cadastral coverage actually conforms to ground truth. Now, modeling the relationship between people and land is very complex. So I came across this land administration domain model some uh, six years ago in the Netherlands. And I'm very high on it because its strength is to capture a suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities. That's the yellow box. Or what we would call social tenure relationships in non-Western societies that links persons, that's the green box, with geographic places, the blue box. And these are geo-referenced geographic places. So very different than the Western concept of formal land deeds and titles that have to do with ownership right or perhaps a, a leasee's rights. This suite of rights, restrictions, and responsibilities would include uh, issues like who has the right in this communal or tribal land to harvest ground nuts for food, to harvest timber for uh, cooking fires. Oh, again, to pasture their flocks. We're talking about water rights. And what about uh, nomadic people? Do they have transit rights? Or these might be the herders who need to pasture their flocks differently um, spring and fall, summer and winter. In the developing world, those who have informal land rights, they don't have fee simple ownership where they can buy and sell a plot of land, they'd be very happy to have occupancy rights, to be the sole and undisputed person who has a right to dwell in a place. Across the that, it is a, a drilled down graphic of the one on the previous page. And not visible on this topographic map are the tens of thousands of mud straw homes recently constructed uh, along the river. To get at this ground truth, one has to drill down and then one will find, perhaps to one's surprise, uh, informal settlements, which is the United Nations uh, euphemism for slums that they have uh, sprung up here. In this next graphic, you'll see that with imagery alone, one can discern very little of the human geography or cultural knowledge of who is on the land, how are they on the land, and why are they on that land. I'll introduce the word uh, cadaster here because it's not a word that we usually use in American English. It derives from the Latin for a uh, land and property registry. And a cadaster could answer these questions, uh, who and how and why are persons tied to the land. In fact, I'll suggest that with cadastral data, a new discipline of property intelligence could come about. And the idea behind that is to take a person, which was blinking, and tie that person to a geo-reference land parcel. So this is the idea behind the cadaster, and I'm very excited to show you how this idea has been realized. Uh, 
Now, this graphic, I'm sure you can identify with the situation. Uh, all too often in the developing world, an advanced party member from a military service, from the State Department, from USAID, or even an NGO will uh, go out to be the advance party and scout out an area of operation. Let's say it's for humanitarian assistance or disaster response or some other type of stability operation. And they uh, have an interview with the host nation government official who tells this advance party member that, oh, your area of operation is all government land have no worries when in actuality the uh, human terrain looks something like this. So looking at these overlapping layers, let's imagine a, a well-watered valley, if you will, and every year a family of herders do what their ancestors have done for century. That is, they bring their flocks to pasture in the valley. That would be layer A grazing. And in this same valley, there are also farmers practicing their ancestral livelihood. That would be layer B, agricultural. And these two groups have had a long-standing verbal agreement that allow the herders to have the water rights every spring. But recently, a major drought has forced a related ethnic group from a neighboring country to also settle in this valley. And the government here does not enjoy afternoon, folks. This is uh, Staff Sergeant Bryant with the CKC. Um, I'd like to welcome you to another one of our speaker series. Uh, the CKC, the Cultural Knowledge Consortium, is a joint interagency effort of the U.S. government to support the development of socio-cultural knowledge and facilitate knowledge exchange across a breadth of social-cultural communities. Um, you can learn more about us at CKC. Uh, excuse me. You can learn more about the CKC at www culturalknowledge.org. Today's speaker is uh, Doug Baston from uh, NGA. He'll be speaking about the ground truth in human security. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible during his uh, presentation. If you have any questions, you'll be able to enter them in the question and answer chat pod. It will be in the upper left hand corner when we switch to his presentation. Um, to help us in prove everything please leave your questions till the end and we'll get to them this webinar is being recorded and will be rebroadcast re on the CKC website if you wish to view it later or come back and revisit any part of it um, this is an unclassified uh, presentation so please keep it that way thank you very much alright uh, Doug as you're us uh, slides pull up here go ahead and uh, you can take over and continue with your speech hey this is Doug Batson at the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Mothership in Springfield Virginia how is the audio connection it's good sir you're uh, sounding loud and clear Excellent. I chose this presentation's title, Ground Truth and Human Security, very carefully because it is also the tentative title for a fall 2012 publication from the Army War College's Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute. I've been conducting research at the Army PKSOI on the role of land governance in United Nations peacekeeping and also in US stability operations. So think of this as a sneak preview of the forthcoming publication.
starting in Afghanistan, I've been involved in researching the role of land tenure and property rights in reconstructing, reconstruction and stability operations for the last six years. In this graphic on the left-hand side, you'll see that I am sitting as a guest of the Norwegian Refugee Council, an NGO in Afghanistan that is conducting land dispute resolution. In the yellow box, you'll see 